you know, your doctor doesn't call you up and say, are you sick today? You know, don't expect your accountant to call you if he's not the right accountant, but reach out to him. Business of Architecture, episode 239. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects and designers where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video that I prepared by going over to freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one solution for architecture firm management. From project management to accounting, time and expenses, billing and business intelligence, Core makes work easy. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. A big shout out for M. Rainville that left a podcast review on iTunes. Fantastic. We are up to literally 98 ratings on iTunes. So if you want to be number 100, that would just be pretty awesome. Uh, M. Rainville, thank you so much. You say, I currently work in the corporate architecture environment. This podcast is helping me gather my mind and prepare for the inevitable transition to starting my own firm. Interesting. I would love to hear more about how solo practitioners are making or not making use of visual programming and database design, as this is my passion and hope that solo practitioners are making use of these tools to do more with less. Hey, send me over what you know about that. I'm always interested in finding out more information. Just email me at enoch at businessofarchitecture.com. Today's episode is a bit different than most. Craig Cody, a certified public accountant, reached out to me and wanted to share some tax tips here on the show. Interestingly, he's a former New York City police officer and also a certified tax coach, which basically means he specializes in helping business owners like you find the most tax efficient structure for their business. So if you're not in the U.S., a lot of the specifics here we discuss won't be applicable to you. On the other hand, if you're getting ready to pay taxes or wondering if there are ways you can save some money ethically and legally in this area, then you'll find this conversation interesting and valuable. And yes, I am talking about money. Hey, Craig, welcome to Business of Architecture. Thank you very much for having me. I'm psyched to be here today. So give our listeners just a quick overview of what you focus on. Sure. I'm a CPA. I'm a certified tax uh, coach, which is somebody that focuses on business tax planning, ways to legally reduce your liability. And, you know, that starts with a lot of communication with your current CPA or account. So we look for legal ways for clients to reduce their tax liability and, you know, quite honestly, keep more of what they make. They work hard. So we do have an international audience here. And are these this conversation going to be exclusively U.S. based or are there going to be things that can be applied to other nations as well? I think there's definitely the communication part um, cannot hurt in other nations. So um, I'm not that aware of the different tax uh, issues in different countries, though I've had some clients in different countries. But I think if you communicate, there's, there's no downside there. So what are the main mistakes that you see people making where they're perhaps losing money because of overlooking certain uh, taxable issues? actually just failing to plan, you know, so they talk to their accountant CPA once a year, maybe twice a year. uh, But nobody's looking for ways to legally reduce their liability. So you go out, you buy a car, you do some research, right? Nobody's doing research on what can I be doing differently? Or what am I actually doing that is actually, I'm, I'm able to write off. So people fail to plan. And by failing to plan, all they're doing is putting the right numbers in the right boxes. And they're, they're typically costing themselves a lot of money. Walk me through. So obviously we're, we're talking about architects here. Walk me through what a professional services provider, what are the kind of things they need to be considering when they make this plan? Okay. What type of entity are they operating out of? Typically what happens is they're ready to start a business. They talk to their attorney and he says, okay, we'll make an LLC because you know, in, in your state, that's the best legal protection. Um, or we'll be an S corporation, we'll be a corporation, or just be a sole proprietorship. There's no coming together of your attorney and your accountant and saying, okay, what works best for both ways? And there is a way to get your cake and eat it. So that's a, that's a big one. Um, actually having no retirement plan is a big issue. Um, are you able to hire your kids? There's ways to make, um, you know, make that summer camp or that hockey camp tax deductible. Are you taking advantage of different types of family and medical benefits you can take care of? Um, 
Do you have a home office? Are you spending enough time uh, working out of your home to qualify for a home office, which then makes any travel between your home office and your other office deductible? Um, are you taking car expenses, auto expenses? Um, are you deducting your meals? Uh, it used to be up until December 31st, if you had a home office, you could have a home athletic facility, which meant you could write off your home gym or your pool. Which, that went out with the, the new tax laws. But um, the big thing now is a huge planning opportunity, Section 199. And somebody in the government really likes architects because they exempted most professionals. Um, they put a cap on how much you can make and still get the Section 199 deduction, which is basically... 20% of your pass-through income becomes a deduction. Um, most other professionals are capped depending on how much money they make, and it actually phases out, whereas architects, there is no cap. So an architect making $300,000 on a K-1, if they do everything correctly, they can wind up with a $60,000 deduction just based on that K-1 income. So there's a lot of planning that has to go in there, you know, because there's different things that um, – I'll call them hoops that they need to jump through that shouldn't be that hard, but for some people, they may need to do a little bit of planning. Okay, Craig, yeah, you throw a bunch of different acronyms there at me or numbers of forms at 199, I think K1. Tell us what those are. Walk me through just that one example of tax deductions based upon, I think you said uh, past due receipts or something like that. Okay. Explain so that in, in normal person language. Sure. Please. So section 199 is part of the new tax code. And what that means is when you have pass through income, which most business have, have some type of pass through income, if they're a, an LLC, a partnership, or an S corporation, you're going to get a K-1. That's, that K-1 number, your ordinary income is considered pass-through income, meaning the partnership doesn't pay the tax itself. It flows through to the individual and the individual pays it. So section 199 says, we're going to give you a 20% deduction for that pass-through income. So if you're a K-1, which is the net profit in that, let's say partnership, was $300,000, you should wind up with a $60,000 section 199 deduction on your tax return. In order to take advantage of that, there are certain things that you have to make sure you've done, such as you've paid the right amount of wages because that deduction is limited to 50% of wages paid. So if you're a sole practitioner, you have to be careful um, and you want to make sure you meet all the requirements so you get that full deduction. I know it's a little technical, but it's just, it really means talk to your accountant, talk to your CPA, make sure you're doing what you should be doing to take advantage of this. Okay. So, uh, I'll just say that most of our listeners probably have a uh, pass-through entity. They might have an S corporation. They might have uh, a general partnership or something like that. You know, as architects being licensed professionals, there's really no way that you can hide behind the veil of liability protection, at least not here, mostly in the in a lot of the states in the U.S. So, because of that reason, I find that a lot of firms do go with, um, like I said, a, a, an S corp or a, a general partnership. Of course, there are some larger companies that go for the the normal C corp. So, let's just focus on those the kind of the pass through entities, the S corp, the partnerships. What suggestions and tips do you have for architects as we're coming up to tax season here in the U.S.? What are the kind of conversations that they need to have specifically about specific deductions that you can kind of enlighten them? Sure. So section 199 doesn't take effect until January 1st of 2018. So, so if they haven't done their tax returns yet for 2017, um, or even if they have, it means nothing. Okay. But if they haven't done their tax returns, architects were um, allowed to claim a deduction on the domestic production activities deduction, which was came down to, that was like a 9% number. So a lot of names, a lot of numbers. When you meet with your accountant or CPA, say, hey, am I entitled to this domestic production activities deduction? Which can be, that was 9% of whatever your domestic production activities income was. Most architects, that's going to be your net income. So you need to communicate with them to make sure you take care, advantage of that. Going forward, you wanna make sure, do I have the right entity? If I have the wrong entity, is there a way to change it? Is there a way to change it retroactively? So you have to have this conversation with your CPA or your accountant to see what we can do. And a lot of times there are ways to change things retroactively. 
Sure. And what would they be looking at in deciding whether they have the right entity or not? What are the things that typically would be considered? Well, we're always talking about things from a, a tax perspective. So they may have, they may be an LLC for liability purposes. And like you said, most professionals don't have that much liability protection. All right. But from a tax perspective, you may be able to make an election to have that LLC taxed like it is an S corporation. So you get the best of both worlds. So you want to have that conversation and hopefully the person you're dealing with is knowledgeable enough and he knows about the different things that you could do. Yeah. I mean, I think according to my memory, and I guess this is on the record, I'll have to look this up, but I like here in California, I don't believe that you can even have an LLC as an architect. It's just not even allowed. Right. And California's got some funky rules. And I think um, you can't be a single member LLC as a professional um, because we do have some clients out in California. Yep. Okay. So talk to me more about saving money on my taxes. So let's, let's talk about your retirement plan. Do you have a retirement plan? Are you using the best type of retirement plan? Do you want to put more money away? Um, are you having a great year? Is there a way to employ your wife? Can she do some work for you? And then you could put away another $18,000 for her as long as she's performing valid services. Okay. Let's talk about that. Let's see, see how someone would implement something like that in their business. So let's just say maybe your wife is doing some bookkeeping for you, or maybe she writes the checks. Um, Maybe she does some marketing for you. Uh, you could hire her. You pay her a reasonable wage and maybe that's $21,000 a year for whatever she's doing. Then she goes and she puts $18,000 into her 401k plan. So she reduces, so you've reduced your income now by your 18,000 that you're putting into your retirement plan and her 18,000 that's going into a retirement plan. Even after FICA taxes, this still could save you, especially in California, three or $4,000. Okay. That's, that's one type of plan. And obviously planning goes into a 401k because you can't do a retroactive 401k. Whereas if you've already passed the deadline, pretty much the only thing you could do is a regular IRA or what they call a self-employed pension plan. And if you have employees, you may have to cover them. So if you did some planning, you could take care of that and not have to worry about paying people or, or taking care of other people that you may not want to because you're already paying for workers' compensation insurance, disability insurance, payroll taxes, everything along those lines. And then if you're having an even better year, you might want to look at a, a defined benefit plan. And um, there's a lot of ways in defined benefit plans to really get up with the 90% of the deduction, even if you have other employees. You know. So if you're not using a regular off-the-shelf plan. Okay. What's a defined benefit plan? A defined benefit plan is, let's just say you're a 40-year-old male making $250,000 a year and you're going to work for the next 25 years. What a defined benefit plan is, it's going to say, okay, you need to put away $150,000 a year for the next 20 years or 25 years in order to be able to have enough money socked away to retire at 65 at $250,000 a year. So what that does is allows you to put more into a retirement plan. And a lot of people typically shy away from this because they deal with the big mutual fund companies out there who are using off the shelf software. And that, and they think, well, if I put a ton of money away for myself, I need to cover all my employees and it's going to cost me a lot more money when in actuality, that's not correct. If they work with somebody that actually really knows what they're doing, there's a lot of rules where they could actually put a lot more money and we've done plans where upwards of 90% of the money has gone towards the owner. Okay. And so that's a defined benefit plan. I got correct. it. Correct. And, and we don't sell plans. We're just advisors. Um, then we have the, the home office. You know, I think most self-employed people are spending some time at home working, whether it's, you know, answering emails, doing billing, writing proposals. So if you have space in your home that you use exclusively for your business, you now get to deduct a portion of your real estate taxes, your mortgage interest, your utilities, your repairs, your maintenance as a home office deduction. Additionally, based on the new tax rules where you're, Real estate taxes and your state income taxes are, are capped out at $10,000 a year. That's a way to recover some of those expenses that you're not going to get in the future. When you have a home office, uh, you typically have to spend at least 15 hours a week working there to be a bona fide home office. Now, 
your travel between one office and the other office becomes deductible. So now those vehicle expenses that may not have been legitimate in the past become much more legitimate. Okay. And if you haven't been taking them in the past, now you're eligible to take them because it is truly business mileage. Let's say there's someone who owns their house. For instance, we own, we own our house free and clear, you know, um, what are the options there? Can you rent space to yourself? You, you can rent space to yourself, but then what happens is you, your business gets a deduction and you pick it up as income. So there's not that great of a benefit there. I've heard through the grapevine that there's something about a certain amount of rental income that you can get on your, on your return here in the U.S., and it's not counted as normal income. Is, there, is that true? Do you know something about that? Yes, we, we, we call that the Augusta rule. And it's basically you're re- allowed to rent your house out um, for up to 14 days a year and not pick up that, that rental income as taxable income. And we call it the Augusta rule because it probably has something to do with the PGA tour where they were in some remote area, there were no hotels, and they wanted to entice people to rent out their home. So, if you rent your home to your business, let's just say for up to 14 days a year, you do not have to pick up that as income. So maybe the first Monday of every month you have a meeting of, you know, your senior people in your home office, you know, now, and you're going to rent your home for the day. You now get to deduct that rental fee on the business and not pick it up as income. So that could be, you know, thousands of dollars that you're not paying tax on. Legally. Makes sense. So you, you mentioned hiring our children and a lot of times we hear about politicians that hire their children and all this kind of shady things going on. I mean, is there a legitimate way to do that? That's really, you know, 100% square uh, ethically, but then also allows someone to get some tax benefit from doing that. Most definitely. So number one, everything you do, you need to document. So when you hire your kids, you have to make sure you document what they're doing. You have to pay them a reasonable wage. So you can't be paying the kid $100 an hour to stuff envelopes. Um, You document it throughout the year. You make sure they get paid and the money gets directly deposited into their bank account, their personal bank account. And then what you do is you use that money for either, you know, to pay for their summer camp or their hockey camp or whatever it is. It becomes, so you're effectively making that a deductible expense. Or we have a lot of clients that use that to fund Roth IRAs. So by the time the kid's, you know, 18, 19 years old, he has a ton of money saved up. And when he goes to take it out, he's going to pay no tax on it. We tell our clients you need to document every week. Typically kids are working, you know, on Saturdays or maybe they're working one day after school, depending on their age. The tax court actually ruled you can use um, kids as young as seven years old. I don't like to have anybody employ anyone under the age of 11, but you just have to make sure you document that they get paid a reasonable wage and you do it the correct way. And there are some ways where you could actually do it where they're not actually subject to FICA tax, which is that 15% tax. So in a place like California, where upwards of you might be in a 50% bracket based on the state and the federal tax rate, you might wind up paying 15%. um, But that's a, 25% 25% savings, 35% savings on five or $6,000. And if you have a couple of kids, that could turn into a lot of money in your pocket. Awesome. So what are the quick wins? Obviously, there's, there's the whole idea of tax planning. Sure, go talk to your accountant and that's great advice to give to our listeners. But do you have any other quick wins, things that you can give us here in this interview, Craig, that they can just take away and instantly pocket some cash in the old wallet? There's nothing you could do instantly because you have to document everything and it has to be done over time. Um, but if you, t- if you start today and you start planning today for the full year of 2018, you'll put a lot of money in your pocket. You know, we typically save a client, you know, we start at about $20,000 a year. I would say the typical client that comes to us for tax planning is saving 20 grand or more a year. So in five years, that's $100,000 in savings. That's a lot of money. Yep. So in addition to what I'm looking for here is tips we can give our audience takeaways that they can, will make them money over time. So things that they should be talking to their accountant about. You mentioned, talked a little about being able to hire family members. We talked about, uh, you know, retirement planning and how to maybe maximize that for future. What are, what are the things there that you want to bring up? Well, I I think you want to have a conversation. Am I, am I in the most tax efficient uh, type of entity for my business? That's a, that's a big one. And that we see very, very often. Um, 
let's talk, we talked about retirement planning. We talked about hiring your kids. How about a medical expense reimbursement plan? Do we have high medical expenses? Depending on the type of entity we are, we could set up something called a medical expense reimbursement plan and deduct those expenses that are, they may be deductible, but because the threshold we need to meet in order to make them deductible is so high, we don't get to deduct them. So I had a conversation this morning with a a parent who had to send this child to a special school. It was costing them over $100,000 a year. It was, it, the, the child is, has a severe injury. For some reason, the school district won't cover it. So we are setting up a plan where he could actually get a deduction for that through his business by doing some planning, and he'll get a deduction of over $100,000 next year. It just comes down to talk to your accountant, talk to your CPA. What can we be doing differently? You know, I tell people, you know, your doctor doesn't call you up and say, are you sick today? You know, don't expect your accountant to call you if he's not the right accountant, but reach out to him, okay? Force him to talk to you. If he won't, still won't talk to you, then you need to go and find somebody else. There are people out there that will talk to you. How, how aware are accountants generally of these type of ability to save money? Because uh, the, the few accounts I've talked to, a lot of them, uh, it doesn't seem like they practically go out of their way to do any of this tax planning with their clients, which absolutely blows my mind. It makes no sense. I just don't understand how that could be. They're aware. What happens is they're overwhelmed. They don't set up time for planning. They have all their clients coming to them the busiest time of year. There's no time. There's only time to get the right numbers in the right boxes. And then the, the cycle repeats itself all over again. Whereas there are accountants out there that, you know, focus on tax planning and say, you know what, if you're going to work with us, you need to do A, B, C, and D in order to work with us because we want to save you money. And that, in that case, you're looking at your accounting fees as an income item instead of an expense item because it's saving you money. Awesome. So if any of our listeners wanted to reach out to you, Craig, what are the specifically, how would they do that? And what kind of services does your company provide? So um, we're a full service CPA firm. We only work with business owners and real estate investors. Um, We're actually setting up a a separate page on our website at uh, craigcodyandcompany.com forward slash architecture where they can actually request a free copy of uh, my book, The 10 Biggest Tax Mistakes That Cost Business Owners Thousands. They can call us at 516-869-4051 or email me at craig at ccodcpa.com. Go to our website, check it out, um, and uh, touch base with us. And at the very least, get a copy, a paper copy of our book. Awesome. Where could they pick up a paper copy of that book? All they have to do is go to that landing page, craigcodyandcompany.com forward slash architecture. They'll pop in our information and my sister, Adina, my assistant, Adina, will send it out to them. Okay. Thank you, Craig. Well, it's been fantastic having you on the show. Thanks for sharing some, helping us think about the importance of tax planning. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. That is a wrap. As a podcast listener, get access to my free four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. You can also get it by texting the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architects. Peter Drucker famously said, what's measured improves. BQE Core lets you easily measure your key financial performance indicators, and it's dead simple. Get insights on the profitability of your firm with a beautiful and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm and keep your hard earned profit. And they have pricing structures that work for the smallest of sole practitioners to the largest of firms. Learn more and get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.